sometimes, but Jacob Simmons. Uh-huh. Cody. Am I Cody. Cody. JB, am I still on? I'm still on. I'm still on. We're so looking forward to witnessing what God's going to do during the Holy Week. On Friday evening at 6 p.m., March the 29th, we have our Good Friday service. Child care will be provided for birth through pre-K. We have our Easter weekend. We'll have four identical services starting Saturday, March 30th at 5 p.m. Then Sunday, March 31st at 8, 9:30, and 11, we'll have child care for birth through pre-K. We'll have live worship in the worship center and our family life center, all four services. everybody. So good to see y'all. Glad y'all decided to join us uh, once again. Hello to those of you who are joining us online. And as I've been saying every day, if you want to um, uh, pull out your device real quick, or if you're watching this, feel free to share uh, on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you may be watching uh, so that more people can join us uh, for the great word uh, that Pastor Jacob Simmons has for us today. And so he's going to be talking um, a lot about um, the Passover lamb, and I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it, so don't worry. So, <laughs> um, but spoiler alert, it was 2,000 years ago, so if you, yeah, it's, it's a good, is it, as good a time as now to know as any, uh, but he's going to be talking more about how um, God is in control and, um, and uh, essentially how even in the turmoil of, um, of the last few days of, uh, of Jesus's life here on earth, uh, that even though it seems that that sinfulness was taking over, God was still in control. Amen? And uh, I think that's a word that a lot of us need to hear today that um, that even for those of us who are in Christ, it doesn't mean that we are without sin. It means that we, though we may stumble, that we may be stumbling forward, if that makes sense. But the power and the love of Christ that is strong enough to save us is strong enough to keep us. Amen? And so... Um, 
We're gonna do a little bit of something that we don't normally do, but we're gonna try it out on y'all, so hopefully it's okay. We're gonna um, uh, introduce to y'all a, uh, a song that we, uh, that us three have written together. Um, and it's just about the love of Jesus and the security of the believer. And, um, and hopefully it'll tee up well to what Pastor Jacob's going to be talking about. But uh, most of it is pulled um, from, uh, from the book of Jude. And it's a very familiar passage. And we can all go ahead and stand together. I saw Miss Melinda standing. I'm sorry. I left you hanging. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to read this out loud. And then, uh, then we will sing this, uh, this song together. Okay. And it says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. Here we go.
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us, and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. the greatest of your name. It stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions of your name. It stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation. song forever to the Lamb. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, then sing the song forever to the praise so father we approach your throne today with gratitude 
Lord, with confidence for what Jesus Christ has done for us, Lord, for the iniquity that we are about to hear um, that he went through on our behalf. And Lord, we praise you that the love that was strong enough to save us is faithful and strong enough to keep us for each of our days. Lord, we give you all of our praise today. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Well, everybody, you can be seated. Thank you for joining us on this Thursday of Holy Week. Whether you're here in person or watching online, this has been such a special week, hasn't it? It really has, to just walk through the events that are leading up to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so today, we're gonna be in Mark chapter 14. You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles. Uh, we'll pick up right where Jonathan left off yesterday in verse 12. I do wanna say tomorrow we'll have our last noonday service. And so for those watching online, feel free to tune in tomorrow as well to, uh, to our noon service. But also we'll have a uh, Good Friday service at 6 p.m. right here in the worship center. We're gonna take up the Lord's Supper. We're gonna see even some of the significance of that today, even this morning. But if you're with us and wanting to read in the scriptures, it'll also be, I think, on the screen as well. But we're gonna start in chapter, or verse 12 here in just a moment. But just to br give a brief recap, we saw that Sunday started the triumphal entry of Christ, obviously, into Jerusalem. We talked about the cursing of the fig trees, the, chain, the casting out and the uh, overthrowing of the money tables and the money changers in the courtyard there. And then Tuesday went into the parable of the vine grower. Brother Jay did an awesome job talking about that and the widow that gave her last two coins. And then yesterday, Brother Jonathan, he said, hey, we compared the woman who anointed Jesus with the betrayal of uh, Judas, which we'll actually look at a little bit today. But I loved what he said. He said, as we have gone through the week, so has the tension been building. And that is so true, even of Thursday, Holy Day, or Holy Week this Thursday. This day would have marked the last day that he would be with his disciples this would be the day that he would enter into the upper room with his disciples to take of the last Lord's Supper with him in their presence and before he was arrested in the wee hours of the morning on Friday morning. And so if there's one thing for us to take away today, one thing that if you could walk away and say that you learned today, I hope it's this, that Jesus always has an intentional plan and he always has an intentional purpose. Those two things are always true when we see in Jesus. A lot of times people think about Jesus as being out of control, that this was something that he couldn't help, or maybe that he was caught off guard by some of the things that were going on, but we'll see in our passage today that that was not the case. He had been saying for time and time and time again that we, uh, that his disciples, hey, I'm gonna have to go to the cross. I'm gonna have to bear the sins of the world, and then I will be raised up on the third day. He told them. And they still didn't understand, they still didn't know. But the question is the same that it was for the disciples as it is for us today. Do we believe that this Jesus is our king? Do we truly believe that he is the one that is totally in control? And I can guarantee you that the good, the bad, and the ugly, even death on a cross is used for God's purpose. And so for today, I want us to see that three big truths about Jesus. Every good Southern Baptist guy has a, Three big truths, and I want you to realize three things about Jesus. Number one, he's in control, always. Number two, he is our Passover lamb. We're gonna get into that here in just a little bit. And then also, he's never surprised. He's never surprised. So as you look at our passage, look at verse 12. It says, on the first day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters to the owner of the house, the teacher, uh, tell him, the teacher says, where is my guest room for which I may eat of the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready, prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them. That's very important. And then they prepared the Passover. In verse 17, when it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be grieved and they said to him one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the 12, the one who dips with me in the bowl. For the son of man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. 
it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. There's a lot to unpack in this passage, but again, those big truths that stick out, number one is he is in control. You see Jesus here tell two of his disciples, hey, go into the city and find a man that's carrying a jar. Now, and you need to know that this wasn't a normal thing. And typically, even you know the story of the woman at the well. Typically in their culture, this was something that a woman would do. No man of the house would go and fetch water. And so this was an unusual thing for them in their culture. And so whenever they see this man, they are to ask him, hey, let me go up into your upstairs room and pe- prepare a place for the Lord Jesus. That seems like it would be a radical and maybe a little bit weird thing to do in our culture today for me to just say, hey, can I come use your upstairs bedroom? But for Jesus, he knew that he had a specific purpose and a specific plan. And God does this all throughout scripture where he, he wants us to see as his followers that there is no other way to explain what happened other than Jesus Christ. And so looking throughout all of the rest of scripture, you can see example after example. Think about Abraham and Sarah back in the time when Jesus said, hey, you will bear a child in your own age. They even try to skirt his plan, but God said, no, I'm gonna give you a son and through your son will come a nation. And then also Moses leading Israel out of Egypt. You know that he in his own power could not split that Red Sea but God himself did it and made a way. Joshua conquered Jericho by walking around the city. We tell that as a children's story, but y'all think about the gravity of what they did, looking foolish to the enemy, and yet he conquered and he did it only by his hand. This last one is one of my favorites. I think about Gideon, whenever they came across the Midianite army of 130,000 people and they had 30,000 on their side. That seems like a, a bad feat to begin with, but then God dwindled them down to 300 men. And uh, any person in their right mind would have never thought that God could do something like that, but he did. So I say all that to say God does all of these things so that at the end of the day, his people would say God is in control and I am not at the end of the day. So let me ask you this, do you think that he is in control of your life totally? Or do you think that he is, you're trying to control it more on your own? I know a lot of us can look at our circumstances and we may think that they are absurd or unfair, but I can promise you that God's plan supersedes any of our plans. And his understanding is greater than our understanding. I was talking about this with my wife, Hannah, last night, and she said something that was really good. She said, our unknowns are known to the Lord. That's such a good truth that's seen all throughout the Bible. Our unknowns, what comes next, is not known to us, but it is known by the Lord. And so for us, that should be an encouragement today. That's the first truth. Our second truth is that he is our Passover lamb. You see in verse 16, he says, and they prepared the Passover. I love what Luke's gospel says. Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So why was Jesus earnestly desiring to eat this Passover with his followers? Uh, I I wanna take you actually back, I love that Corey said that a second ago, take you back 2,000 years ago uh, to the time when they would actually take of the Passover and what it looked like for the Jews at the time. First, they would take a lamb several days before, and this lamb was to be unblemished male lamb. How significant is that, that our Lord Jesus was unblemished male lamb, right? Sounds familiar. And then also, this is so key. They would, when they entered the house, a servant or a slave would wash the feet of their guest. The master of the house, the head of the house, would never in a million years do this. So, much less the Messiah that was to come. So think about the gravity of him coming into that room that night, later that night. He would come into the room and wash his disciples' feet. That's why Peter had such a fuss. He said, no, Lord, you will never wash my feet. That wasn't supposed to be done, but yet he showed humility in that. And then also they would take of the four different cups of wine and each one symbolized something different. I wish we could get into it today, but it's so good. After the taking of some of the cups, they would tell the Exodus story of when Jesus passed over the Israelite families and delivered them from slavery. What they did was signify there the importance of remembrance, the importance of looking back on what God had done. They would sing hallelujah psalms together, literally the psalms, they would sing them together and then they would serve this lamb, this Passover lamb as as a meal and then they would break the bread together in remembrance of what God had done. And so why do I tell you all that? Why do, I, why do you care what the Passover looked like 2,000 years ago? I'll tell you this. Jesus knew that this would be the last supper that he would spend with his guys and that he would say, hey, this wine is my blood. 
This bread is my body. That lamb that we're eating on tonight is me. And the disciples wouldn't understand this at the time, but later Paul would write, for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. So they didn't quite understand the gravity of what was taking place, but what he was doing was saying, hey, I am this Passover lamb that has been celebrated for years and years and years and will continue to be for years to come. And so for us, do you truly see God in that way? And do you take this week to celebrate that? There is no more weight of sin because the sacrifice has been made for you. That deserves an amen. 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 Hallelujah. You couldn't do that yourself. This act is an act of true humility that should lead to worship in our hearts. I love what Jonathan said yesterday. It was the, the comparison of one act of worship versus an act of just wanting the wealth of this world, that we should desire the wealth in Christ and in nothing of this world. That is what this Passover lamb signifies. So taking time to remember this week is crucial for us, that he is our Passover lamb. And then thirdly and lastly, he is never surprised Jesus knew that one of his disciples would eventually betray him. And even yesterday in our passage, we saw that Judas had made a deal with the chief priest, but then Jesus brings it up. He knew what was going to happen and he knew what was going on. He brings it back up and I love what verse 21 says. It says, for the son of man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not even been born. Now, Danny Aiken at Southeastern Seminary, he says that this verse is one of the most profound and theologically significant statements in all of the Bible. That's a big statement. He says it's because of this. Jesus showed himself to be the son of man that the prophet Daniel spoke about and also the suffering servant that the prophet Isaiah spoke about. Last night, even in our Wednesday night service, we prayed through Isaiah 53, and you read about how he was pierced for our transgressions. He was cursed for our own iniquity, and yet that same suffering servant is the one who will come on a white stallion one day in all of his glory to come back for his children. This, it's one and the same. It's not either or. It is both and, and that should not only bring us to a point of humility, but it also should bring us to a point of great comfort. That's a comforting thing. Even though Judas betrayed the Lord, you know, he said that he would suffer great punishment even to the point to where it would be better if he had not been born. That sounds very harsh, but he's showing them the magnitude of sin and the consequences of an unrepentant heart. There is great consequences for that. We'll come back to that in a moment. But even though his betrayal was a part of God's plan, Judas was still responsible for his sin. I don't understand how this works, but I know that God is totally sovereign over his plan, but also man is responsible for sin. That's not God's responsibility. If you figure that one out, come talk to me. <laughs> I'd love to hear more. We don't have time to talk about it. What I want you to know today, most importantly, is that Judas, yes, he betrayed Jesus, and it's easy for us to point that out in the story, but I want you to remember that by the morning, all of his disciples would have also betrayed Jesus. They would have fled from him. They betrayed him because of their weakness. They betrayed them because of their fear, and also their lack of bravery. You can see that all in the next chapter of Mark. And so as we work through this, think about us. Like, it's easy to put blame on Judas, obviously, but think about us, all of us. Every act of sin is a betrayal against a holy and just God. So when you and I sin, we commit a deliberate act of rebellion against the God of the universe. And sometimes this feels like there's great weight on us because of that, but <laughs> this makes the gospel so much sweeter. The weight of sin, the weight of death is no more because this Passover lamb that we just spoke about was the once and for all sacrifice for you and for me. And so I know that because of what the Bible says, the blood shed on Friday defeated sin, but the empty grave on Sunday defeated death. And that is true for us today, just as much as it was for the disciples. So this is grace like you and I cannot imagine. We don't understand, we never will be able to understand, but it is probably, not probably, it is the most significant and intentional act of selflessness that was ever committed on earth. It is utter selflessness for us. 
And so for you, as we close, what do you do with this? You know, you learn a lot about Jesus, obviously, as we go through the timeline, but what do we do about it? I'd encourage you two things. Trust his plan and also remember his purpose. Those two things are crucial for this time. We trust his plan because he's shown that he's in control of it and we're not. He, at the root, wants to give us salvation. And so this time is a time for us to celebrate that. But as much as we want to be in control, God desires us for us to give up our control and give our full dependence on him. That is crucial for us to do in this season. And then also remember his purpose for being that Passover lamb. That is so much significance wrapped into that and I wish we had more time to talk about it. But he came to suffer so that you could have salvation. There is no greater act of kindness and grace. And if you think about that for a moment and just the weight of that, that he has offered that to us, all of us, betrayal, betrayal against the God of the universe. We have been given a gift that is free of charge. And so that, remembering that truth doesn't just affect Holy Week, that affects your lifestyle. That affects the way you live. And so I pray, I pray for us as a church that we would not let this be something that just passes by or something that we just talk about on Easter Sunday, but that it would literally envelop every ounce of our being so that we couldn't stop talking about what Christ has done. May we see this as something that we can never get over. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. We thank you for a time to open your word and be together as a church. I just pray that you would give us great uh, respect and reverence for what you did 2,000 years ago for us. I pray we would never get over it. I pray we can never stop talking about it. Lord, that you would allow us to be the vessels that take the gospel to the ends of the world and that this message, this truth, would send us out like flaming arrows into a field that needs you. God, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you for being with us. You can join us again tomorrow at 12 or tomorrow night at 6 p.m. See you then.